Trey. 
pleasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified and laid behind the stone. Wow, what great worship. Welcome to Good Friday. And it is a good, good Friday. It's good because it's the day that the Lord has made. And it's good because it's a day that we remember. Have you ever heard the phrase, I could show you better than I could tell you? I felt like that's what Jesus did today. And it's not that he couldn't tell us, but he was trying to tell us and we just couldn't hear him. So he said, I will show you better than I could tell you. In John chapter 12, he actually says, except a seed falls in the ground and dies, it remains alone. He said, but when a seed falls in the ground and dies, it produces a whole bunch of other seeds. You and I are that seed that he produced because of his death. Today is a day about giving. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the, that's the point of Good Friday, that God so loved us that he gave. In the midst of that and learning about seed time and harvest through his death and learning how it's produced us, I also want to challenge you in your natural giving. I can't think of a better time to sow a seed and to really plant into the church than today. Take that example that Jesus was. And if you've not given with us before, the information's on the screen. It's super easy to do. You can text to give. You can cash app. You can give through our app. You can give online. All sorts of ways to give. You can even mail a gift in. Not because the church needs your money, but because you're joining up with Jesus who said, I could show you better than I could tell you. During this Good Friday service, we're going to do communion at the end of it. So I want you to get ready for that. I want you to get your elements ready, whether it's a, whether you have grape juice and bread or you have something symbolic of it, something you drink and some little cracker or snack to snack on just to symbolically 
partake of Good Friday. And Bishop's going to share this amazing message in a minute. But I think in order to set up this great message, we need to have a greater understanding of the cross. So like Jesus, I can show you better than I can tell you. Lean in. cross. It was meant to horrify the world. It was meant for humiliation. It was meant to last for days. It was meant for slow asphyxiation. It was meant to prolong torture. It was the Roman soldier's job. It was meant to be used by Caesar, but instead, it was used by God. It was meant to stop a movement, but instead, it became the way. It was meant to act on fear, but instead, it awakened faith. It was meant to be vicious and violent, but instead, it became our peace. It was meant to uproot hope, but instead, it became the seed. It was meant to punish captives, but instead, it unleashed freedom. It was meant to build up Rome, but instead, it built God's kingdom. It was meant to discourage rebels. It was meant to stop insurrection. It was meant to put down Jesus, but instead, it set up his resurrection. It was meant to jeer and mock him, but instead it was his glory. It was meant to erase a chapter, but instead it became the story. It was meant to hold up convicts, but instead it raised up a king. It was meant to shut our mouth, but instead it's why we sing. It was meant to be a judgment, but instead it became our mercy. It's why the song of heaven is the lamb. The lamb is worthy. It was meant to kill an enemy, crush dissenters and diversion, but instead it became the banner of God's love for every person. It was meant to be appalling, nailing hands and feet to wood. It was meant to be used for evil, but instead it was used for good. It was meant to be a symbol of God's assassination. But instead, it became the symbol of Jesus' invitation. Come to the cross. Instead of sin and stain, you are meant to be made clean. Instead of being forgotten, you are meant to know you're seen. Instead of being ashamed, you can leave behind your guilt. Instead of feeling empty, you were meant to be fulfilled. Instead of being broken, you are meant to be made whole. Here, Calvary is calling. It beckons you. Behold, come to the cross. Instead of being an accident, you have a purpose and a plan. Instead of being abandoned, you were chosen by His hand. For all who've said, I can't, God has said, I can. No matter what you've done, the invitation stands. Come to the cross. Instead of being doubtful, you are meant to know your father. You are meant to be his son and you are meant to be his daughter. You were cherished from the start. You were always in the picture. Instead of being a victim, you were meant to be a victor. The result of Jesus' blood, salvation has arrived. Instead of being dead, you are meant to be alive. The cross, it was meant to signal death, but instead, it's a sign of living. It was meant to be the end, but instead, it's our beginning.
Once again, welcome to our Good Friday service in a virtual capacity. I pray that wherever you happen to be today, that God is just reminding you that on a Good Friday, He demonstrated His amazing love toward us. I want to read the Good Friday story. It's really the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and it's found in Matthew chapter 27. Beginning at verse 24, it says this, When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to the place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink it. Then they crucified him, and they divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they did cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put a sign up over his head, this accusation that was written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left, and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads. They said, You who destroyed the temple and can build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the entire land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard this said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on the reed and offered him for it to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly and they said among themselves, truly, this was the Son of God. It's a good Friday. And it's not a Good Friday because it's a time of celebration. No, Good Friday is not really a celebration. It's really a remembrance or a commemoration of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ for us. Good Friday is a reminder to us that in the darkest of days, in the toughest of moments, Jesus went to that cross for us. And because he went to the cross for us, we can have an expectation that just like there's a resurrection coming on Sunday morning, that there's resurrection life coming into our hearts as well. Because as, the, as glorious as the resurrection is, the, the, the joy that we celebrate on a resurrection Sunday, there can never be a resurrection if there had never been a crucifixion. And see, really the crucifixion for us is supposed to represent a death to Satan's bondage. And, and it also should represent a death to his dominion over our lives. But can I just say this? The, the crucifixion should also represent a death to our old way of living, our old way of thinking, and our old way of being. Good Friday is where we take the time to say thank you to Jesus for his sacrifice, but also we recommit our lives to never let his sacrifice be in vain. I want you to grab hold of this quote right here. Good Friday is where we purposefully thank God for brand new life in Christ Jesus. Come on, wherever you are, that's a good place right there. Just take a moment to thank God for brand new life. Come on, I'm not who I used to be. I might not be who I desire to be. Maybe I still got a long way to go. 
But I'm thanking God on this Good Friday for brand new life in Christ Jesus. The scripture over in Philippians chapter 3 verse 7 that says this, Paul is talking and he said, I once thought that these things were valuable. Now, if you go back and read the context, Paul is talking about his education. He's talking about all his connections. He's talking about his his family pedigree. He's talking about the people that trained him and deposited into him. And Paul is saying at one time I was puffed up. One time I used to brag about uh, sitting at the feet of Gamaliel and how I learned and, 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 and my rich heritage. He said, I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could simply gain Christ. Come on, that's a good place to say amen. Come on, that's a good place to say amen. I want to remind you that we should never, ever look back at our previous life as if we actually gave up something to come to Christ Jesus. Like like the Israelites. The Israelites were always looking back, and even though they prayed to God to get them out of Egypt, and they prayed to God to rescue them and set them free, they were always looking back and talking about how good they used to have it back in the old days. Would to God we were back in Egypt. And without realizing it, we can sometimes do the same thing. We can get into a funk, get into a bad space, or maybe things haven't worked out exactly like we planned. Maybe God's timing doesn't meet up with our timing. And we can start looking back, remembering how it used to be as if we left something to come to God. There's a, a parable in the scripture that talks about the pearl of great price. And I've, I've heard some, several ministers, even people I respect, talk about the pearl of great price you know, being uh, the kingdom of God. And it talks about how the merchant man went and sold everything he had when he found this pearl of great price and he went and purchased it. But I I can't believe that the kingdom of God and relationship with God is the pearl of great price. Because if you think about it, what did we actually give up to come to God? We gave up nothing to come to him. We gave up our rags. We gave up our sin. We gave up our unrighteousness. We didn't give up anything of value to come to him. He's the one who left it all left all of eternity to come here chasing after us. No, God saw us as the pearl of great price. I remember one time years ago, I used to tell the story of of how I I left Michigan State and I was a mechanical engineering student. And and, uh, when I would uh, talk about going to Bible school, I used to tell the story about how I'm in Bible school right now, but but I I used to be at Michigan State University and I was a mechanical engineer and and, uh, I was working for General Motors and I was making a lot of money. And And I used to tell the story in such a way that it seemed like I left something great to go to this lowly little Bible school. And I remember one day, right after I had shared that story with somebody, the Lord just arrested my heart and said, son, don't ever tell that story again as if you left something great to follow me. Because no matter what you had in your past, it is nothing compared to the honor we have of getting to serve the king. Somebody ought to give God an amen, maybe even give God a shout of thanksgiving because we get the glorious privilege of serving the almighty God. Philippians 3 verse 10 says it this way. Paul continued on. He said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Watch this being conformed. We we could even say being surrendered to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The scripture teaches us that we are supposed to be conformed to the death of Christ. We're, We're commemorating his death on this Good Friday. And the Bible says, the scripture says, we are, we are supposed to be conformed to his death. Now, what does it mean to be conformed? Dictionary.com defines conformed as this, to be or become similar in form, in nature, or in character. In other words, we're supposed to mold ourselves, shape ourselves into the, the, the image or the picture of his death. I remember years ago, back in the day when we were still called Faith Christian Center, before we became Impact Church, we were Faith Christian Center. There there was a a particular member of our church who had, for whatever reason, had gotten upset, offended, whatever, had left our church. And I remember April ran into her in in a grocery store, and she was asking, where have you been? What's what's happened? And she says, yeah, I left FCC because I didn't like the way people lost themselves in church. And when she shared with me, I was like, well, that's kind of sort of what's supposed to happen. I, I don't mean we're supposed to lose ourselves in church. But can I just tell you, we are supposed to lose our old self in Christ Jesus. It is a shameful thing to come to Christ, be saved for many, many, many years, and look back at your life, and the new life doesn't look any different than the old life. We are supposed to lose ourselves in Christ. That's what the Bible refers to when it says we have become new creations in Christ. God doesn't want us to stay the same. And we are thankful on this Good Friday that we have the opportunity to be conformed to His death. Let's take a look at at our our, our dance team, just reminding us 
of the goodness of God. And yes, we are indeed conformed to the image of Christ. as you are, just as you are, it's time to come home out of the dark, there's no need to hide, he already sees you, don't be afraid to show him your face, he won't turn you away, he'll never turn you away. Everybody needs, everybody needs, everybody needs saving. Everybody breaks, everybody bleeds. You don't have to be ashamed. Call on Jesus, say his name. Just receive him in your heart and you will be saved. God has raised him from the grave. Just believe it in your heart and you will be saved. Simple as that. Don't overthink, don't complicate it. No strings attached. Saves us. Oh, there is power in the 
Don't overthink, don't complicate it No strings attached He loves you, he loves you Everybody needs, everybody needs Everybody needs saving Everybody breaks, everybody bleeds The savior is a breath away Yes and amen. Everybody needs saving. And I don't know about you, I thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ that has saved me, continues to save me, and will keep me all the way to that day of Jesus Christ. I want to pick back up reading in John chapter 19, beginning at verse number 30. It says, Jesus drank the wine and said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Then the Jewish authorities asked Pilate to allow them to break the legs of the men who had been crucified and to take the bodies down from the crosses. They requested this because it was Friday and they did not want the bodies to stay on the crosses on the Sabbath or Shabbat since the coming Sabbath was especially holy. So the soldiers went and they broke the legs of the first man and then they went to the other man who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. Everybody say already dead. Come on, come on, say already dead. They saw that he was already dead, so that they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, plunged his spear into Jesus' side, and at once blood and water poured out. So Jesus is crucified on the cross, and really because of the torture that he took before they even crucified him, in such a short period of time, he gave up the ghost. He died. And because they didn't want these bodies left up on the cross during the the, the Sabbath day, they they didn't want the the, the sun to go down. These bodies are still hanging there. So they came and broke the legs of the first guy, broke the legs of the second guy, the thief that was with Jesus. But when they got to Jesus, they were going to break his legs so he couldn't get down off the cross and maybe take off and run and, and, and revive himself. But when they got to him, they found that he was already dead. And what's amazing to me is that The early doubters of Christianity, they didn't struggle believing that Jesus was alive on the third day. There really wasn't a whole lot of debate about whether or not he was alive. And because people saw him, multitudes saw him. It wasn't just a handful of disciples. There were two on the road to Emmaus that saw him. Then there were the the 11 disciples in in the room that saw him. Then they came back and Thomas was with them. He saw him as well. And then there was a, a moment when over 500 of them saw him at one time. The early doubters weren't struggling with the fact that Jesus was alive. They actually struggled with whether or not he was ever dead to begin with. Can I just tell you this? What's crazy is that the unbeliever today doesn't doubt that you're alive. They don't doubt that you got a better moral life. They can can see some things have really changed. They can see that you, you you don't cuss as much as you used to. And they can see that maybe you've changed some things in your life. But what they really struggle and what they really question is whether or not you have fully died to begin with, whether or not that old you has really been indeed crucified with Christ. I want to take a moment and just share with you from ChristianAnswers.com what Jesus actually endured for you and me. Because when we watch these Hollywood stories and when we see, you know, some of these pictures, we see a little trickle of blood on his head and we see a little small, beautiful scar on his side. But when you really understand what Jesus went through for you and me, It's a reminder to you that if God went through all of that, if he allowed his son to go through all that for you and me, you better believe he's going to with him also freely give us all things. I think the passion of the Christ is probably the best depiction I have ever seen of what it really means to have been crucified. And even that movie can't do any justice to what Jesus did. I think it's about a 40 to 45 minute scene there where they're whipping him, they're beating him. And it's almost it's hard to watch. But the truth of the matter is, that's indeed what he endured for us. Listen to this. Medical medical experts, historians, and archaeologists have examined in detail the execution that Jesus Christ voluntarily endured. All agree that he suffered one of the most grueling and painful forms of capital punishment ever devised by man. Here's a brief summary of some of the things we know about his last hours from history, from archaeology, and from medicine. Severe stress even before the abuse began. Jesus had the weight of the world on his shoulders. Even before the crucifixion began, he clearly had physical symptoms associated with severe stress. The night before the execution, the disciples reported seeing Jesus in agony on the Mount of Olives. 
Not only did he not sleep all night, but he seems to have been sweating profusely. So great was the stress that tiny blood vessels were rupturing in his sweat glands and emitting a great red drops of blood that fell to the ground. This symptom of severe stress is called hemothydrosis. Jesus was physically exhausted and in danger of going into shock unless he received fluids, which he apparently did not. This is the man that the Roman soldiers then decided to torture. Having previously been beaten by the Jews, it was now time for the Romans to torture him. The beatings administered by Roman soldiers are well known to be very bloody, leaving lacerations all over the body. Romans designed their whips to cut the flesh from their victims' bodies. These beatings were designed to be painful to the extreme. It would also cause a fluid buildup around his lungs. In addition, a crown of thorns was forced into his scalp, which was capable of severely irritating major nerves in his head, causing increasing and excruciating pains as the hours wore on. In Christ's severely stressed condition, these beatings were easily enough to kill him. His body was horribly bruised, cut, and bleeding. Having had no nourishment for many hours and having lost fluids through profuse sweating and much bleeding, Jesus would have been severely dehydrated. This brutal torture would certainly be sending him into what doctors call shock, and shock can kill. In addition, Jesus was forced to carry the wooden beam on which he would die. Imagine the effect of carrying a heavy weight if you were in that condition. Hung completely naked before the crowd, the pain and damage caused by crucifixion were designed to be so devilishly intense that one would continually long for death, but could, not, but, but could linger for days with no relief. According to Dr. Frederick Zugibi, he's the chief medical examiner in Rockland County, New York, Piercing of the median nerve of the hands with a nail can cause pain so incredible that even morphine won't help. Severe, excruciating, burning pain, like lightning bolts tra traversing the arm into the spinal cord. Rupturing the foot's plantar nerve with a nail would have a similarly horrible effect. Furthermore, the position of the body on the cross is designed to make it extremely difficult to breathe. Frederick Farrar described the intended torturous effect. He said this, for indeed a death by crucifixion seems to include all that pain and death can have of, a, of horrible and ghastliness, dizziness, cramps, thirst, starvation, sleepiness, traumatic fever, tetanus, shame, publicity of shame, long continuance of torment, horror of anticipation, mortification of unintended wounds, all intensified just up to the point at which they can, can be endured at all, but all stopping just short of the point which will give to the sufferer the relief of unconsciousness. I want you to understand, he did all this for you. As you sit and listen to this, and I know it may be hard to hear, but I want you to know this is how much God loves you. Because remember, Jesus really declared at any point he could have called for angels and they would have stopped it all in a moment. I, I love to say it this way. I've heard it said before. I, I didn't come up with this. It wasn't the nails that kept him on the cross. It was love. It was thinking about you on this Good Friday. It was thinking about whatever your biggest struggle is right now. It was thinking about the lie that the devil's trying to tell you to give up and quit. Throw in the towel. It was love that kept him on that cross. It was his love for you and a love that no human being can properly describe. One doctor has called it a symphony of pain produced by every movement with every breath. Even a slight breeze on his skin could bring screaming pain at this point. Medical examiner Dr. Frederick Zugibi believes Christ died from shock due to a loss of blood and fluid, plus traumatic shock from his injuries, plus cardiogenic shock causing Christ's heart to fail. Scripture says this again at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., at the time at which the sacrificial lamb was killed every day in the Jewish temple. Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And soon he died after saying it is finished. About this moment, probably the time when the temple's priestly ram's horn would have been blown that day, announcing that the priest had completed the sacrifice of the lamb for the sins of Israel. Also at that same moment, the thick, great curtain that closed the Holy of Holies room from view, it ripped open from top to the bottom. James Thomason believes that J Jesus did not die from exhaustion, the beatings, or the three hours of crucifixion, but that he died from agony of mind produced 
that had produced a rupture of the heart. His evidence comes from what happened when the Roman soldiers pierced Christ's left side. The spear released a sudden flow of blood and water. Not only does this prove that Jesus was already dead when he was pierced, but Thompson believes it also is evidence of cardiac rupture. Respected physiologist Samuel Halton believed that only the combination of crucifixion and rupture of the heart could produce this kind of result. I hope you grabbed hold of that, man. I really hope you grabbed hold of that because on this Good Friday, I want you to let that image of Christ hanging there on that cross, going through excruciating pain, let that be a reminder to you that God so loved you and he so loved me and that he's fixed his gaze on us and he will never, ever let us go. Mercy 
erased my guilt to be saved by your grace and captured by your love. I've been saved by your grace and captured by your We've been captured by His love and called to be conformed to His death. We've heard about the death of Christ. We've heard songs. We've, we've reflected on the death of Christ. But let me leave you with this. Three areas that must conform to His death. Remember, we told you at the very beginning that we're called not just to live this life and not to celebrate His death. But we're called to be conformed to His death. Let me fit into it. There are three areas in particular that I want to share with you that need to conform to His death. Number one is the deeds of the old man. The deeds of the old man. Colossians chapter 3 verse 8 says, But now you must also rid yourselves of all of these things. Get rid of anger and rage and malice and slander. Get rid of all that filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with his practices. And I've watched this. You've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of his creator. Said salvation, we, we really are made new in Christ Jesus. The day that we say yes to Jesus Christ, if any man be in Christ, the Bible says he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. The day we say yes to Christ, we internally become a new creation. But then we've got to allow Holy Spirit to help us lay down the old deeds. Help us lay down the old attitudes. Help us lay down the old appetites so we can put on the new man. It's like, like this jacket. You know, I didn't just wake up this morning with a jacket on. I mean, literally, after I got up and got showered and, and shaved and everything else, I had to put on this jacket. It didn't just hop on me. Well, the new attitudes, new ideals, new way of thinking, new way of treating people, it doesn't just happen because we get saved. Yeah, we become brand new on the inside, but the Bible tells us that we've got to become conformed to His death. Before I can put on new attitudes, I've got to consciously go back and strip away the old attitudes. That means we got to go back and correct those attitudes that I'm not talking about the ones that happen at church. We know what to do at church. At church, you go, praise the Lord. You, somebody, somebody step on your toe. You go, go, girl, don't worry about that. I'm fine. I'm talking about the attitudes that show when we're outside of church. And if we don't watch it, we can have an inside of church attitude and an outside of church attitude. And God wants us to become conformed to his death. When we put those outside of church attitudes back into the grave. I remember I was at the barbershop years ago, man. I was at the barbershop years ago, and this lady was sitting across from me, and I guess she recognized me as a, as a pastor. And, and she, you know, sometimes, sometimes when people see me outside, they get real deep and spiritual. She started, well, praise the Lord, Pastor. God is good all the time. I know the Lord is working miracles in your life. And while she's sitting there talking, her phone rang, and she had it on loud, and she had a, a ringtone. And, and her ringtone said, said something about, let me see you bounce left and right, and let me see you show the lean. And if you could have seen the look on this woman's face, if she could have crawled under that chair and slid it out of that barbershop, she would have. I, it wasn't even embarrassing to me because I understand we're all human beings. But the point I'm making is let your outside attitude, your outside words match up with who you are when everybody else sees you as well. And that's something God wants us to all work on so that we can put to rest those old attitudes. We also got to put to rest those old shifty and manipulating ways that used to work for us to try to get our way. You know what I mean? You know, you know what I mean? When, when we used to have that little way that you, you mistreated somebody or maybe you, you put them in the, in, the, in the cold zone or use that emotional punishment. And what God wants us to do is learn how to be more and more like him. We have the fruit of his spirit on the inside of us. We have his love and his joy and his peace and his long suffering and his gentleness, his goodness, his faithfulness, his meekness, his self-control. And what God wants us to do is learn how to yield more and more to the fruit of his spirit and less and less to the old ways and old habits from our past. Listen to this. Don't allow your past to become a part of your present and turn around and wreck your future. And let me say that again. Don't allow your past to become a part of your present and end up wrecking your future. Even right now, as I say this, part of the word of the Lord to us this year is that it's a year of the presence of the Lord. But he also said in that that there's some people that we may have to put some distance between so we can make sure we allow his presence to abide with us at all times.
Second thing that we got to crucify, we got to become conformed to his death in this area is the spirit of me. The spirit of me. Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4 says, when you do things, do not let selfishness or pride be your guide. Instead, be humble and give more honor to others than you do to yourselves. Do not be interested only in your own life, but be interested in the lives of others as well. See, there's a selfish spirit right now, a selfish me spirit that is just dominating the world. I mean, it's just taking over the world. Man, people, it, it, is, it is amazing to see how, how some people just don't care about anybody other than themselves and maybe their own family. And if we don't watch it, that same spirit tries to creep into and try to dominate even inside the church as well. That's why you have marriages being destroyed because I can't take it anymore without even fighting for it, man. Without going to counseling, without trying, without, without being willing to make some compromise and some adjustments. That's how you have children that are being abandoned because I need to finally be happy. And there was a time, man, we should talk about the deadbeat dad, but can we just be honest? There's some deadbeat moms too. Why? Because of a selfish spirit. And what we got to do is make sure we recognize that's not me. That's the old me. The new me has been renewed in Christ Jesus, and I've got to conform to his death. We have people who, who, who even struggle sometimes to serve in church, half-heartedly serving in church, because I'm not getting paid for this. Well, the truth of the matter is, everybody in the church is getting paid. You may not be getting paid money, but every day we get up, we get the oxygen turned on because God is with us. We get angels that protected us all night long while we slept and, and kept us from car accidents, and, and we don't serve because we want to make sure nothing bad happens. But we do serve with a heart of gratitude because we care about somebody other than just ourselves. Sometimes it, it, it pains my heart. I've been doing some research with some of my, my, our business partners and, and realizing just how many children are still being abused, not only through human trafficking, but through pornography and pictures being uploaded on the dark web. And, and even in families, man, sometimes we have children being hurt in families because of a prideful spirit that doesn't want the family to be embarrassed by calling somebody out. We got to get rid of that selfish me spirit. And Good Friday is that opportunity to remind ourselves he died for us. He put his own life on the line for us. And we got to make sure we care about somebody other than just ourselves. See, Jesus raised the bar of selflessness really high, raised it as high as it ever could be. And it's now time for us to turn around and match him. And the last thing I want you to grab hold of that we got to put aside on this Good Friday and conform to his death in this area. And that is in racist attitudes, racist attitudes. I love this verse in Ephesians chapter two, verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, those of you who were far away from God are brought near through the blood of Christ Jesus's death. Christ himself is our peace. He made both Jewish people and those who are not Jews to be one people. They were separated as if there was a wall between them, but Christ broke down that wall of hate by giving his own body. The Jewish law had a lot of commands and rules, but Christ ended that law. His purpose, listen to this, was to make the two groups of people become one new people in him and in this way make peace. It was also Christ's purpose to end the hatred between the two groups, to make them into one body and to bring them back to God. <clears throat> Christ did all of this with his death on the cross. Man, I hope you grabbed hold of that. I, I hope that you, you heard the revelation of what God said. So we, th we thank God that his, his death on the cross brought new life to us and gave salvation to us. But can I just tell you, the scripture says he also intended for his death on the cross. The purpose of his death on the cross was to end the feud, not only between the Jews and the Gentiles, but also between the blacks and the whites, between the Hispanics and the Indians, between all groups of people. So we can't stop what's happening in the world. Can I, can I just tell you, in the world, racism is going to get higher. <clears throat> We're going to see more and more things happening in these last days because one of the signs of the end times is ethnic group will fight against ethnic group. But in the church, it ought not be that way, man. We, we ought not have a hard time sitting next to a black person or a white person in church or an Asian person or, 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 or a Chinese person or, or whatever the ethnic background might be. Because in Christ Jesus... He's made all of us who come from different backgrounds, different bloods, different tongues to be one in him. He ended the feud and really gave us the opportunity to be a demonstration to the rest of the world of what it looks like when his love unites us. See, God intended to bring all feuds between all people to an end through the blood of Jesus Christ. He makes no distinction between his children and neither should we. 
It's time to die to the old racist attitudes that were passed on from generation to generation. Truth of the matter is, I went back there in the 30s and 40s. Your, your grandparents, your, 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 your mom and dad, they weren't the ones who, who uh, committed those heinous acts. And what we've got to do is bring reconciliation to the world by demonstrating that we have the heart of our Father. See, Jesus shed his blood for all men, black men, white men, red men, yellow men, brown men, women, children, straight, homosexual. God is not the one who's making this wall of division. He's the one that's bringing us together in the spirit of love. Good Friday is a reminder to us to resist the evils of racism that will become stronger and stronger as we get closer to the end. But Jesus Christ is the one who unites us together through his blood and makes us one in Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow your head wherever you are and just close your eyes for a moment. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior on this Good Friday, what better time than today to take this opportunity to say yes to him? So with every head bowed at wherever you happen to be, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, can I just ask you, would you just give me an opportunity to lead you in a really simple prayer? I'm going to ask you to just take this moment when I count to three, and if you're ready to give your life to Christ, when I get to three, just lift up your hand right there where you are. I know it feels a little weird because I, I, I can't see you. You can see me, but I can't see you on the other side of the camera. But can I tell you, heaven has you right there in its scope. And so if you lift up your hand, it's just your way of saying to heaven, I'm surrendering. It's your way of saying to heaven, I'm ready to conform to the image of his death. It's your way of saying to heaven, I'm ready to be resurrected as a brand new person in Christ Jesus. So when I get to three, be bold and courageous and go ahead and raise your hand. Here we go. One, two, three. Come on, lift up your hand. Come on, in every living room and in every hotel room, right there gathered with family, friends, or if you're by yourself, if you're ready to give your life to Christ, just lift up your hand. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, every one of you that raised your hand, I want you to just make this confession. Say, dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me on this Good Friday. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. I know he paid the price for my sin, but I know you raised him from the dead, and I know he's alive right now. Jesus, come into my heart now. Save me. Forgive me. Make me brand new. I surrender my life to you for the rest of my days, and according to the Bible, I am born again. Amen. Come on, put your hands together wherever you happen to be. Come on, let's just take a moment on this Good Friday. Just, Good Friday got better just now. Let's just celebrate all those who took the time to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. And in just a moment, Pastor Rodney's going to come back and give you some instructions on what to do now that you've given your life to Christ. But don't, don't disappear. Don't think we're done because we're also going to take some time to seal this whole day with Holy Communion. God bless. Wow. Thank you, Bishop, for an amazing word. And thank you for an invitation to give our lives to Jesus. If you're one of those people today that said yes to Jesus, you don't even know why you tuned in. One of your friends said, hey, my church is doing something you need to check out today. Or maybe you've been watching us for years and you realize I needed to give my life. If that's you, whoever you are, we want to send you a gift today. Since you gave your life to Jesus, we don't want to just leave you alone. We don't just want you to be out there by yourself. We want to uh, partner with you. We want to be a part of your community. But when you're on your own, you can get a copy of this book. It's called the Fresh Start Book. And if you would text I see deeper to 97,000 right now, you will get a downloadable version of this book. And it's a seven day journey. It's just going to help you make some decisions. It's going to help you to begin to put on that new man the bishop talked about. He said, you got to put it on. And so this is going to tell you how to put it on. I'm going to tell you, you need to uh, put on Christ through baptism. That's what the Bible says. And there is a page right in the front for you to sign up for baptism next Sunday will be Baptism Sunday here at Impact Church. This coming Sunday is Easter Sunday. Next Sunday, Baptism Sunday. We would love to be a part of that journey if you're in the Jacksonville area. Please sign up. But text I see deeper to 97,000 and you can get a copy of this book. And it's just a gift from our pastors to you to help you in this journey. All right, now, if you're still tuned in, are you ready for communion? Are you ready to participate in the Lord's Supper? I think it's interesting today that Bishop shared so many things about Good Friday. And Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Do what? He said, well, you're going to take this juice. You're going to take this wafer, this bread that's in here. And he said, you're going to tell the story of my death. 
every time you do this. And that's what Good Friday is really about. Good Friday is about telling the story of the death of Jesus because Sunday is coming. We're going to tell the story of his life. But not only are you telling the story of his death, you're telling the story of your own death. Because Bishop said, we were called to conform and we're able to conform. We're able to experience this victory because there was a crucifixion. But because there's a crucifixion, we also know there's a resurrection of life. And so Jesus says, you need to do this and do it in remembrance of me. Do it in remembrance of what? Do it in remembrance of the crown of thorns. Do it in remembrance of the whipping. Do it in remembrance of the uh, hemotidrosis. Do it in remembrance of the pleural cardiofusion. Do it in remembrance of the dehydration. Do it in remembrance of my death. But Paul says, I want to experience the resurrection of Christ. But he says, I experienced the resurrection through participation in his sufferings. No, maybe you're not getting physically whipped today. I sure hope not. Maybe you're not, you're not being put physically on a cross, but in remembrance, you are participating in the death and suffering of our savior. Remembering we're called to die to ourselves. If he died for us, we die to ourselves so that we can put on Christ just like Bishop shared with this. So are you ready? Are you ready to uh, celebrate with me? Are you ready to remember with me? Are you ready to sit at this communion table as a family? Because only families can really sit at tables together and break bread. I'm ready. And so what we're going to do is hopefully you got your elements ready and you have your, uh, you have your juice and you have your cracker or your drink or your piece of bread. And what I like to do is whenever I do this, I remember all of the benefits that he provides. He provided salvation. He provides healing. He provides restoration. He provides my daily resurrection. And I remember that he paid a hefty price for it. The Bible says his body was broken. So I like to take the the wafer and I like to break it. Maybe if you have bread, you tear it. But he said, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. So I take this body like it's the paper, like it's the contract, and I partake of it. Father, right now we ask you to bless this bread. We ask you to bless what we consider to be symbolic of this body, which was broken for me for the remission of my sins, for the forgiveness, for healing, for restoration, for everything according to life and godliness, for my contentment, for my sanity, for my right mind, for a full life and calling on this earth. And then we take the bread and eat. And then after we take the bread, we remember that this contract had to be signed and he signed it in his own blood on the cross. He commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners. Says Christ died for us. Take this in remembrance of him. Wow. Did you do it in remembrance of him? I did. And I can't think of a better way to remember who Jesus is than through what he did. But I don't just want to remember this. Actually, the Bible says this. It says, Before they, Jesus went to the cross, he had his last supper with them and he broke bread. And then it says they sang a hymn and went out into the night. We're going to go into one more worship song. And then we are going to be so excited to celebrate the resurrection with you this weekend. We love you impact family. Have an amazing day. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb and all who've gone before us all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb your name is the highest your name the greatest, your name stands above them all, above all thrones and dominions, all powers and possessions.
positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry oh holy how creation cry oh holy you are lifted high holy only for Forgiven, if you've been redeemed, sing the song forever to ah, If you want your freedom, and if you bear his name, sing the song forever to Oh, sing the song, sing the song forever. joining us for Good Friday. We'll see you at Easter at Impact.